and welcome to Making Sense number four on the sense of hearing. We are here today at the Futurium Berlin with a live audience and also with an online audience through our live streaming on YouTube at the Expro Berlin channel. So my name is Fernanda Parente and I'm going to guide you through the program today. Making Sense is a B2B networking event series created and hosted by Expro Berlin a new European B2B marketplace for experienced technology products and services, a new format of Messe Berlin and Retune, which is a festival and network at the intersection of art, design, and technology. This series is supported by Futurium, the house of futures, where we are today. And yeah, if you are in Berlin, the ones watching us from uh, home, yeah, it's totally worth visiting Futurium at another point. Today's event, as I said, on the sense of hearing, um, and we have once again uh, invited a few experts to share their views on the topic. The format is quite simple. Each speaker has 10 minutes to give an impulse talk, and afterwards we have a discussion where all of you are welcome to join, so please, afterwards, after all the impulses, you're welcome to raise your hand, we have bring you a mic, and if you are at home, you are welcome to please type your questions in the comment sections of the YouTube channel, and we will read out your questions here. So a note on timekeeping for the speakers. If you're running out of time, I'm going to slowly creep up onto <laughs> the stage. Uh, so don't be alarmed, just to let you know in a very subtle and friendly way that your time is up. So let's try to uh, keep to the 10 minutes because we have four speakers and we want to save as much time as we can for the discussion. So let's get started with our first speaker. We'd love to welcome on stage Johannes Helberger. He is a sound experience innovator and UX futurist. He's also the founder of the Sound Innovation Lab. He has been designing sound experiences for real and virtual spaces since uh, 22, uh, 20, 20, oh, 2002. How can I say 22, 2002? That's in correct. 2012, now I can say 20 something. In 2012, you founded or co founded Kling Klong Klong. Mm -hmm. That's how actually we met a few years ago. And a studio for Sonic Experiences, but now your new kind of venture is to set up the Sound Innovation Lab at the TU Berlin. And you're going to tell us a bit about it, right? Exactly. Great. And you told most of the things I wanted to tell <laughs> in the beginning, so I can skip that part, which is great. Um, I'm not so used to have a video audience and a real audience and my notes here. I'm going to try my best to, to make it worthwhile for you guys. So thanks for inviting me, Robert and Julian, and also Fernanda, to bring me here. And um, as a potential starter for our discussion, I have a quite, let's say, provocative title that sound experience is life experience. Um, and why is that? Because I think sound and music has this great ability to evoke emotions in us, and as our emotions, again, um, influences our perception of that very moment, and that very moment is our life, basically, from moment to moment, I think sound experience can be, at least, contribute to life experience. So, let's start with some recordings I did yesterday from my personal life experience. This is not my kitchen, but it's a kitchen, but the sound is from my kitchen. It sounds like this German design kitchen. And uh, so when I want to put my child to sleep and put on the Bluetooth speaker, that she kind of calms down, it sounds like this. Battery, 90%. Mobile device, not found. I mean, Ready to pair. Real. If you're a parent, you know what that means. So thank you, Bose. Uh, sorry. And Another thing, then I bought this um, silent vent for my child to kind of cool down when it sleeps. And the silent vent does a good job. It's silent when it works, but if you want to turn it on, again, sounds like this. And now scale this up in the future when we are surrounded by smart things which want to communicate with us. Um, Battery, 90%. I think there's a lot to do in real life sound experiences. And so that was my intro for the Sound Innovation Lab. So 
I think, Fernanda, you said most of the things I wanted to say, but a small background skills for who I am. I'm a sound artist, sound experience designer, and creative director for more than 20 years. As Fernanda mentioned, Kling Klang Klong um, was what I worked for the last 10 years with three colleagues. It's a studio for sound, sound experiences. And we did a lot of interactive experiences and immersive experiences also here. The AI music part is from us. And throughout the years, we started to have like bigger projects all over the world, designing the whole sound scenographies for exhibitions and venues and museums. And yeah, but some time ago, I decided to leave Kling Klang Klang behind to pursue innovation projects with my new company. Um, and in the last years, I've been involved mostly in disclosed research and uh, development projects for big te tech companies and car manufacturers. And we were designing prototypes to answer questions like, how would cars in the future sound like? Or how would smart homes in the future sound like? But the thing is, very often the reflex now is that people create sounds which are based on brand values and they sound super beautiful. And this is not really wrong, but I think it's missing the point. Because innovation by definition has to be useful for us. And um, so design, any design should be user-centered or planet-centered at least, and not brand communication-centered. So I think the basic underlying question when you do research and development and if you do design is in sound, where can sound improve our everyday lives? At least that's the question where I base my new venture on and try to, to make useful things. And with that question, for me now, science became a very important part of, of my work because, for example, as a, because, yeah, as a little example, this is a scientific research which found out that sound can have a positive impact on health in hospital settings. And if you've been to a hospital, it normally sounds awful. And it also means that in the other way around, if it's like in a noisy environment, it would damage your health. And so you go to a hospital to get better, and actually you, be, you are put into a surrounding which kind of tracks or which hinders you getting better. So these are all questions where sound can have an impact to improve our everyday life through sound. And yeah, that's why at Sound Innovation Lab, we bring together designers, engineers, and scientists, to, um, especially, I have to mention the audio communication group at the TU Berlin, where I do seminars in sonic interaction design and work with them a lot to make these things better. Um, and also to find the right design questions, which can really help us. So one big topic, let's say, in the industry is mood management. Um, because in whatever situation, if you want to put people in a certain mood, Music and sound is a very effective way to do so. Actually, on the way here, the taxi driver told me that when he collects people from the club, he puts classic music to calm them down. He tells them, like, guys, you want to go home, you want to calm down. And he said many people go with that, and I really love that story, especially before this event, because he... And then he started telling me, like, which put music he puts on for whom and so forth, and this really gave me a strong impression that, you know, mood management works on many ways. So one project, for example, where we worked with this, sorry, I have to drink a small bit of water. <clears throat> 10 minutes is not a lot, so I tend to speak fast. If I speak too fast, just tell me. Um, yeah, mood management. So we did, in my time with Kling Klang Klong, together with Samsung, we did this project, the Generative Soundscape, where we also won this 
Design Award for User Experience Concepts, um, where it's an interactive generative soundscape system based on real-time environment input. And the idea here is, or at least the question was, can it help people to concentrate on work or to relax or whatever they do? And in the best case, they don't even have to switch modes, but the TV would recognize what's happening in the room and would um, play the right sound. And we did an evaluation and it's not really surprising that so sound can do that. Um, but yeah, it was very interesting to, to actually work on that generative sound system for these different modes. Another question we got approached with by a big car manufacturer is, can sound help to create trust in autonomous vehicles? We did some workshops and looked at like which, what, what is coming up is this technology in the future. And the assumption is that when the cars drive by themselves, what are we going to do? We're going to sit there, we're going to read, we're going to work, we going to try to relax, we consume media. And, but in order to do so in a relaxed way, you have to trust this machine that it won't kill you. At least in the beginning, right? And you also need to create the right atmosphere. So it's more something for a transition phase to to have this trust problem with the technology. But yeah, we found this very interesting, so we pursued this together with some students from my Sonic Interaction Design course. And um, yeah, uh, designed this prototype called AVA, the Autonomous Vehicle Assurance. And what it does, it, it um, it would communicate you in a very subtle, calming way what is going to happen next. So basically, if you, if you have like normal car sound, you know, your car sound would, would go with your acceleration. This one would go a bit before and very subtle to calm you down. And um, so we made a mixed reality prototype in Unity and uh, with a ambisonic sound system. And then we had like two groups, a control group with normal sounds and one group with um, the AVA system. And the research showed that actually people could, had a higher task performance, which means they could work more easily because very subconsciously you would recognize what's gonna happen. And uh, the quality of experience was also higher. And I think what's interesting about this, and this is something very specific about hearing and the sense of hearing, is that we are able, so we don't have to look at the screen or we have to look out the window, and we are able to, at least if we know what sound is which, we are able to very subconsciously uh, receive this, this information. And um, I think in user experience design, this is this capability of hearing is not really used a lot. And I think um, this is really a key to make things much more convenient in our surroundings um, to, to work with, with that hearing sense abilities. So yeah, no surprise, of course, sound can help to create trust in autonomous vehicles. Again, very emotion, it's, it's about emotion, it's about trust, so I think there's this big strength. I'll spare you the details now with these scientific findings. Uh, we will release a paper at the end of the year, and I'm coming to an end for right now. We will release a paper at the end of the year, but if you're interested in that project, you can approach me um, later or via email. And, um, and also, a small call to action for our Sonic inter uh, Multimodal Interaction Design Seminar. We're looking for project partners to work with our students together on design questions where maybe sound could help to make things better. So, I mean, it's big, big words to improve everyday lives through sound, but I think there's small possibilities. And um, also, as I said, I tried to be a bit provocative for the discussion. 
saying sound experience as live experience. So, yeah, I'm looking forward for later. Thanks, uh, Fernanda, and nice. And thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. To the dot, very good timing. I'm sure you all rehearsed before, right? So you're going to keep the time. I would love to introduce you to our second speaker, Rainian Kim. Uh, she's also known as Portrait Exo. You probably saw her name before on the posters. She's an independent researcher and an artist who creates musical and visual works with traditional and non-traditional methods. She researches computational creativity, human-machine collaboration, and explore new formats and applications for forward-thinking art and sound. Rainier, the state is yours. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I have a very peculiar relationship with sound. Um, thank you very much, Johannes, for that great uh, presentation. And I couldn't agree more, I think, there's also hearing and then there's listening. There's a lot of information that we take in. And I have a very hypersensitive, acute sense of hearing as I was sat there. This image was very loud for me. And I think sound is the most provocative way of experiencing life. It can either be very soothing, it can be very loud and um, completely be immersed and lost in sound. If there was a very loud banging noise, we would still see this image clearly. If a very loud noise happened, I would be drowned, you wouldn't hear anything. Um, and there are certain times when certain frequencies are used specifically to take us out of our state of being such as sirens. And then we have things like classical music to soothe and to um, be a little bit more mindful and present perhaps. So, how many of you here know what synesthesia is? Awesome. So, um, one of the most fascinating things for me as a musician was learning about synesthesia. And I have a relationship between taste and sound that I didn't realize was strange <laughs> until I started having conversations with scientists and other artists who experience life through strange, peculiar ways. So, like, lemon is the highest frequency for me. When I hear lemon as that frequency, I taste it, and, and my synesthesia works both ways. And so, as soon as I learned what synesthesia was and I started collaborating with uh, neurologists and meeting scientists who would publish papers and give me a deeper insight of what exactly happens within these states of cross-wiring of senses gave me a, a much, it was just quite mind-blowing to understand that we have so many micro differences actually, way more than we think. And it's also interesting to learn that we're all born synesthetic, but as we age and we prune, our senses become compartmentalized. So all of these educational and very for me, life-changing moments has been so profound. And so I've become um, very much into radical education. And I've had some very um, beautiful moments of being able to uh, do presentations with people like Dr. Joel Salinas, who is a Harvard Medical School neurologist. And um, we were able to talk about synesthesia, followed by a little sound experiment I got to do with people in the audience by giving them pepper and, and letting them hear what pepper sounded like to me. And I, I just find this really fascinating because had I known about my strange, peculiar way of experiencing sound, um, maybe it would have helped me have a better understanding of why I get overwhelmed with my senses and the way I experience life. Um, and also, maybe it makes sense why kids scream at a very high <laughs> screaming level when you feed them sugar. Sugar, to me, is like a very high frequency. Um, and this form of education I find so useful, and I feel that this is something that 
could benefit us as adults, but also for children. I've met people from different backgrounds, from all different parts of the world who have been subjected to uh, misdiagnosis for having different forms of synesthesia. I've met people who have been subjected to like brain surgery when there was nothing wrong with them, but they just perceived life and felt life very differently. Luckily, I feel very privileged that I never had to be subjected to any of those kind of um, procedures, but they do happen. Um, so this is a, a really fun installation. I did for Dr. Joel Salinas where I got to help translate his multiple forms of synesthesia. And he sees numbers and he also hears strange sounds when he sees visuals. So this is an interactive audio poster where as an experiment, I sent him a bunch of GIFs, and I asked him to take his phone and just record sounds of how he heard these visuals. And then he wrote in more detail of what textures they should really sound like and what were the numbers. So um, this was a really meaningful project to do because when we had this experience in this kind of a format, in a very interactive installation, people were able to touch, feel, hear, experience, but also have a discussion. And uh, this was one of the first interactive installations that I did. And it was just really interesting to hear other people have this new spark of curiosity of how they might perceive life and experience world differently to what they've been taught. And then I got to engage with people from hackathons, and um, I became, I have a little obsession now of trying to use different technologies to give people experiences of my form of synesthesia to perhaps open um, new perceptions for people. So that was a little HoloLens experiment we did where people could touch uh, different textures and colors and hear them the way I heard them. Um, this was a performance I did where um, I fed people different drinks, like grapefruit soda, and they got an audiovisual experiment. And so I'll just play a little bit of the. So they're, the audience is sat there drinking and <laughs> experiencing this. And this is an interactive audio poster as well, when people were fed flower-shaped cookies and hibiscus tea, and they heard a range of frequencies as they ate and drank. Um, sometimes it's really fun when I get to do experiences in collaboration with brands like Infarm. Um, we did a cocktail translation, so I took two of their cocktails and I translated them into an audiovisual experience that people could experience at the bar. And this is my favorite experience I got to do, which was a five course dining experience with Noise Engineering, which is one of my favorite modular synth brands in LA. Um, and they actually really wanted to push my boundaries <laughs> by creating these really incredible diverse dishes and things like pea white chocolate macadamia pea shoot salad. <laughs> and so this experience was really beautiful because it was really intimate. We were in a small space and um, we could have an open dialogue and everyone was just so present. And this is also a really great experience for me to compare to other immersive experiences I've given where it became really important that it's not just about sound design, but it's also the design of the space and how you want to bring people into the experience and how important it is to have actually isolated situations so that people can experience your sonic journey. So. Um, this was one of my favorite. I haven't done another dining experience like this ever since, but um, everyone who was there really loved it. And um, I hope I get to do more. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
Hello, hello. Oh, now it's on. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Actually, it reminds me of a experience I joined once on a boat. And they also got us to like try different foods and wines to different music. And it was just fascinating. Sometimes you were trying the same wine to different music and it tastes completely different. And it's just like, you know, super like mind blowing and also like to, to try different candy and play. they were playing sometimes very kind of high pitch sounds and other times was, I don't know, just classical music or whatever, but they had paired everything with a sound in advance. So yeah, I would love to join one of your experiences next. All right, so um, moving on, um, I would love to introduce you to our next speaker who is already here. Very good. Uh, Stefan Ambruster, he's the founder and CEO of Framed Immersive Projects and Ozomo. In 2014, he had an idea of creating an immersive experience that was based only on sound, connecting the audience to space just by sound. But seemingly, the system you needed didn't exist. So what did you do? You found it. <laughs> framed and you created the Zomo, which is basically the system that you need to create the experience you wanted. So, Stefan, we cannot Thank wait you. to hear about it. Thank, Thank you. You. Uh, you also just talked, uh, said a lot that I wanted to say at the beginning. Sorry. So, but anyway. Um, yes, it was two great uh, talks we just heard. And um, I just realized that I'm probably the only one here who ha doesn't have an educational background in sound. Yeah. Sorry, uh, that I don't, I'm the only one here that has no educational background in sound, sound, I think. So perhaps I have to kind of introduce how I got into this sound thing. And so before I did that, I did create immersive spaces, but visually. So what I did is uh, we created with projections, with light, with mirrors. We created immersive installations like this one when I worked at Tumshink Media and Space. Um, so connecting people and space via media, we, we always, there was always, um, visuals were always used. And I thought at one point, why don't we do that with acoustic, with sound? And um, I tried to find a system and I couldn't find a system. So I got more into that and um, I thought, what do I need for an immersive spatial audio system? what I want that to do. And the first thing I thought, I want to create a unique experience for every user. Not everybody hears the same thing, but everybody has his own experience. The second thing is, I thought, I have to somehow make sure that the people are connected to the space. So I have to know where they are in, where, at what position they are. And then I need a software that does all these things in real time. So. Um, I thought a lot, and then we decided to um, invent or create a system, develop a system. The system is headphone-based. That was not because we like, or I like headphones, but that's the only way how to give unique sound experiences to individual people in one space. The second thing is we had to find a tracking system. We couldn't find a tracking system that was that precise, so we developed our own tracking system. We are precise to 10 centimeters in position and one degree in your rotation. And we developed the software. And with that software, we play real-time sound. We developed the sound is created in the software in real time, depending on your movement, on your head rotation and your movement through the space. So just the quick, two quick examples of many examples that we, uh, things that the system can do. We can have object-based sound, for example. We have three sounds in the space, and each movement changes the perception of that sound. If I get closer to one object, it gets louder or it gets faster, the sound gets faster, and all the other sounds also react, so whatever we want them to do. And the second example is we hear one sound, and we influence effects on that sound. Like when I walk, move through the space, the volume goes up, or the reverb goes up, or the speed goes up, or whatever, so I can do many different things, and every person in that space creates his own journey, okay? Okay, um, yes, and I want to tell you a little bit about the experience we have when we, first when we created the system, and then we, when we did a lot of project with the system. And the first thing we found out is 
that visual feedback is very important. When you have sound and you just move around in a space, you don't really realize that you are the actor, that you conduct whatever you hear. So like in this project that we did, we have black bowls hanging from, this, from the ceiling and each bowl has sounds and when you get closer, things happen. If you take away these things, people don't realize that they conduct the room. They, they just walk and they think it's a playback and things get louder and more quiet. So it's, it's important, we think, that we have a visual feedback. The second thing is sound cannot do everything. So some project we have, people uh, ask us to do kind of everything with the system. They say, okay, we have the system now, so it has to do everything. It has to like uh, uh, guide us, it has to do, I don't know, many things. And for example, guiding is very hard. Like we, this is a project we did in England, just finished that. It's a Roman villa, and the entire villa can be visited by people, and um, there's a journey through that villa. And the idea was that the system tells the people where to go, like go there, go there. And that's very hard because um, if the system tells you go right, okay, when you're like this, it, it works. When you're just the other way around, then you go to the, in the wrong direction, okay? Or you don't understand what the voice said. So things like that don't really work with sound. And again, if you give them a visual clue, that works. If you say go over to the red door, then people understand. They look around, they see the red door, and that's where they go. So... Um, yeah, sound cannot be used to do everything. And one other thing we found out, for me that was the most astonishing thing, because I actually come from the visual part, is that sound is more powerful than visuals. What we found out is that, um, or what I think for sound, uh, visuals, um, the people that come in a room like this on the, no, we don't, wait, this, like on the left side, and they stand in there, and it's, perhaps it's 360 and uh, interactive ground and whatever, but they barely move. Some of them move, but not, most of the people don't move. They just stand there and look what happens. And um, with the sound, it's totally different. Uh, on the other side, I just I will show you a film that I recorded at the um, Ars Electronica Center. We have, we have an installation there. And there you see how people interact with the sound. They, they really explore spaces acoustically. You know, they see things, they walk around, they try things again, and they do that very naturally. Where with the visual, in the visual part, you always thought like that they have like some barriers to, to like really move, that they really try things. And here they, they got wild, they, they, do, they did all kinds of things. Okay, and I want to show you three examples of how sound can be used in immersive installations because also that can be totally different in this project for the Club Trans CTM uh, festival that we did at the Botanische Garden. The sound was the art. It was an art project and the sound was the art and was done with, with our system. Um, it was two sound artists from South, uh, South America and the idea was that uh, Humboldt, he, when he went there a long time ago, he gave the names, uh, he gave plants names, but these plants had names before. Okay, so they went in, the, in, the, in, the, in these f jungles and recorded chants and, and songs and stories from the people that live there about these, these plants or the, the names of the plants. There was one plant that's called um, Big, big plant with a big leaf to stand under when it rains. That's how they called it, and he gave him some strange names. Um, exactly, so when they walked around, they had these jungle atmospheres, and every now and then they passed by a plant, and the people started chanting, so it was very immersive. People were very concentrated, so in this project, the sound was part of the art. This project we did at the Com uh, Museum for Communication in Bern, it was Sounds of Silence. It was a, an exhibition about silence. And um, there were no exhibits in there. It was only the sound that explained the phenomena of silence. And all the graphics here uh, are symbols that 
something changes in the sound, something happens in the sound. So when you move through the space, again, the visual thing, as I said before, was important. When you move through this space, uh, the sound changed when you crossed lines, or uh, for example, this one uh, on, the, on the right side was the dots. Uh, when you moved from left to right, you had a trumpet, and the trumpet got more and more noisy from the, from the, the, the way it was played. But the, the fun thing was that it wasn't louder. It was always at the same level. And, but when you walk, there you thought, OK, this is quiet. And on the, on, the, on the black dot, it's really loud. But it wasn't. It was totally the same level. So this was one of the examples um, done there. And we did this with uh, Ideon Klang, a sound uh, company from Basel. And the last I want to show you is um, a project that just opened. It's the House of Hungarian Music in Budapest. And um, that was a permanent ex that's, uh, there's a permanent exhibition done with our system, and that's uh, kind of a very normal use of the system, where there are exhibits, you go there, you get, um, you get sound. And, but here everything is interactive. So when you, for example, here there's a Gutenberg press, and you go there and you can touch things, and suddenly um, the, these people in these in this, in this pictures start singing. And only the people hear that that are pressing the button, that were staying there. So everybody can go there. It's not that everybody in that room suddenly hears loud sound, but only they hear it. Or this uh, is a 360 uh, projection. There are drums here. And if one person drums, little things change in the, in the projection. And if more people drum, then there are suddenly animals come out. The sun goes up. Crazy things happen, and the sound changes. So. It's very interactive, so all the media and all the installations there are, are connected to our system, to the, media, to the sound system, to the sound, and so the sound here kind of in this exhibition supports and makes, makes it very interactive. We have one um, exhibit there, it's a, it's a desk, a table with four chairs, and it's a little uh, classical piece, and when you sit on one chair, you hear the violin, and then if somebody else sits on the second chair, you and that person hear the violin and the cello. And so to hear the, 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 the whole piece, uh, you have to get all the people here to sit on the chairs. So then, uh, then you can hear all instruments. So things like that and m much more. OK, so I come to the end. I want to invite you to an exhibition we, that is just done in, in Berlin with our system. It's at the Kraftwerk Berlin. It's the Tresor, uh, 31. Geburtstag, 31st birthday. Um, yeah, it's open now for two more weeks. And there you can be immersed by sound <laughs> and by visuals and by the Tresor. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I was actually at the, this botanical gardens uh, installation that you mentioned. Yeah, it was super interesting. Good memories. Um, our next speaker uh, is Henrik Langer. He's the co-founder of Instruments of Things, a music tech company specialized in novel interaction possibilities with sound and immersive media based on IoT technologies. His expertise lies in the development of hardware and software systems for real-time processing of sensor data. Henrik, how are we doing with the... Is it up? Nearly there? Yes! Oh, maybe not. While he's setting up, I just want to say um, I'm very glad, Stefan, that you mentioned the sounds of silence. Was it called? I hold that thought. I want to talk about silence at our discussion. This is one of the things I wanted to talk about. Okay, there yeah, you go. Thanks, Fernando. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, as, as Fernando already said a lot, I'm Henrik, and uh, I will rush a bit through the presentation because I thought uh, two hours ago that I want to do a live demo. So I, I have to shrink a bit. <laughs> um, so, yeah, please let me know if, if, if I'm over time. So uh, a few words about our, us and our company. So we founded Instruments of Things in 2018. We have three founders um, with different expertises from different fields. Uh, I personally have an engineering background and basically started uh, developing electronic music instruments uh, since my early youth. And then uh, 
I decided to, to study computer science and electrical engineering, and I had a super cool professor, and then step by step more and more came, so at the, until the point that we uh, founded Instruments of Things. And um, so when, when we founded the company, uh, we had a vision, and it was that there are so many sensor data already available in, in terms of IoT technologies. Like every one of you has, has lots of sensors in the smartphones. There are fitness variables measuring your blood sugar, your, your, your heartbeat, what all these kind of sensor data. And on the other hand, uh, typically you have still quite old-fashioned ways to control electronic music instruments, which is mostly uh, keys and, and turning knobs. So we want to basically make use of this different kind of sensor data to interact with uh, sound and also with visuals. And um, this is how what, what we came up with. So we have some very small uh, motion sensors, which you can see here. And the idea is that you put several of them on your whole body. So your whole body basically becomes a, a controller. And of course, we are not the first people using motion sensor data to control music. This is an idea which is available since the 80s. But it was usually quite hard to use because you have to calibrate it and you have to be quite tech or uh, tech uh, knowledge person. And we want to make this now really easy to use and accessible for everyone and also use lots of sensors simultaneously on, on your body. So, um, and when we started at first, we thought, OK, maybe it makes sense to start with a modular uh, synthesizer community, because on one hand, we love synthesizers, modular synthesizers, and on the other hand, um, these, this community is very, yeah, quite tech-oriented, they like to experiment a lot, and they are quite, uh, let's say, open-minded. So uh, we started with them, and our first product was the 2.4 Sync uh, wireless interface, uh, and it uh, made use of the same uh, motion sensor variables, which I've just shown you. However, it's basically outputs uh, control voltages, so you can uh, yeah, modulate all your different uh, analog uh, synthesizers and electronic music instruments. And by, by creating this project, we um, lots of artists are using this already in stage uh, on international artists and uh, gave us very valuable feedback what can be improved. And the result was our newest product, uh, product SOMI1, which I will do, uh, demo you in a second. And SOMI1 is basically a different uh, receiver, which offers USB ports, or more specifically uh, USB MIDI ports and MIDI interfaces. So you can basically hook it up to any mobile de device, like your smartphone, your desktop computer, and you can control any MIDI uh, compatible music software hardware. So you can basically control thousands of, of different devices and softwares with, with this motion sensor controller. Um, and it's very easy to use, obviously. So um, here's a small, uh, yeah, small picture uh, which, which gives you an idea how it, how, it, uh, how it works. So basically, you can use up to six sensors at the moment simultaneously. And you have uh, this wristband, so I have just one here today. And then you can put it, for example, two on your feet, two on your arms. And they are all communicating wirelessly with the, with the receiver hardware. And uh, this receiver hardware is then basically converting this motion sensor data into uh, signals for musical instruments. So, um, so that's basically the, the, the conversion between the, the, the sensor data and the, the music. So as I said, uh, the professional version is already uh, used on stage by lots of obviously performance artists. Uh, so you have a very nice symbiosis of, of musicians and performance art. Uh, so you can also control the visuals, the stage spots, and all this kind of stuff. So it makes the performance like really unique and, and the art allows the artist to really uh, have a much more high, higher level of uh, expression. And um, yes, this is what it would be typically looks. So in this case, uh, a music software, which is Ableton Live. It's a quite common uh, music production software and some, some visual apps. And I will switch over to Ableton Live now. So, um, and how to set up the, the sensors. So basically, oh, just a sec. Okay, so how it's basically used. Um, so each motion sensor has uh, seven different movement parameters. So we have diff different tilt angles, like in this direction for your arm, or lifting your arm, or where you are pointing at. And then you have acceleration in different directions. And, uh, so each sensor has several different movement parameters available. And now you can... Um, just check if yeah, data is coming. So, and then we have a small tool here, which is uh, made for Ableton. But you can, as I said, you can use it with any music software. And here I can basically select the different movement parameters. Now I can make it more sensitive. I can smooth it. And so there's a lot of options you can do. And let's say now um, we want to, to map uh, a specific sound. So I hope the sound is on. Oh, sorry. 
the wrong audio output. Uh, I guess it's black magic. Okay, so latency is uh, a little bit higher due to the TV, but it's the latency is under 10 milliseconds, so we actually play, can play percussions and, and stuff like that. So let's say I want to uh, c control um, this, this, like this, this uh, parameter here of this filter, and I want to control it by moving my arm. So I will basically just now select the movement parameter here, and I will just solo it. So, so only this parameter is sent at the moment, and then I will just map it here. So now you can see it's mapped. When I'm lifting the sensor again now, you can see that. So it's quite, quite easy to use. And at the same time, as I said, you can also uh, play notes with that. So um, in this case, I've set up a, a small, just a small drum synthesizer. So, yeah. so as I said, the latency is a bit higher, but here's a kick. Here's a rim shot, so you can basically select which sample sound you want to trigger based on your direction. So um, you can imagine how many stuff, how many things you can control with that, and I just used one sensor, and I just used two signals out of it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how many minutes do I have left? <laughs> okay. Um, so of course, uh, still for Ableton or <clears throat> music software, we also need a, a, a bit of pre-knowledge, um, how MIDI works and, and yeah, how, how to, to play notes, for example. So we thought, okay, we want to make this, this motion sensor technology really accessible for everyone, also for children, for example, or for people who have never used any, any music instrument. And this is uh, that we also came up with a mobile app, which works on iOS and Android. And this mobile app has ready-to-use soundscapes. So you really just connect the, the receiver hub to your, um, to your mobile device. You can just open the, the app. As you can see, it looks a little bit like Spotify. And then you can just select the, the soundscape you want to have. And each soundscape covers a different uh, use case or, or a different uh, scenario, let's say. So we have, for example, clubs, which is quite techno and, and quite uh, over, oh, lots of overdrive and kicks. Then we have more ambient stuff and, and also a human 808 drum computer. So you, can be, you become a drum computer. Um, but we got so many input of the people that I have an idea. I want to have a soundscape for yoga. Oh, I want to have a soundscape for meditation or for skateboarding or whatever. And so we thought, okay, let's open this app for sound designers <clears throat> so they, they can create um, um, new soundscapes and offer them uh, as an app purchase optionally uh, to, to other people. And uh, they don't need any coding skills, so, so they don't need any, any uh, yeah, don't have to be programmers. They have to be familiar with pure data, which is a visual open source programming environment, which is often used also in, in science. And you can basically visually create your sounds by connecting different blocks of, of or objects uh, and, and wire them together. Yeah, so that's, that's the app. And um, so I rush really quickly uh, through it. So, so this technology is really, we have the best latency. Um, there's no, at least I haven't tried any product which has that got latency and precision. Uh, you can scale it up even to 16 sensors. It's, uh, it, it's approved per professional. And the next step we want to do is to create a full body motion tracking system based on that. So the idea is that you can put up to 16 sensors on your whole body and then you have a 3D skeleton, like a 3D avatar, which is exactly moving like you in real time. And then you can create, for example, really nice visuals based on that, uh, including with sound, etc. Um, so you can imagine how, how powerful this is. And at the same time, it's scalable. So oh, let's, uh, let's, for example, say you have, you have hybrid concerts. Uh, the, peop the band on stage has sensors on and their 3D avatars in the virtual space are moving exactly that, 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 like them in real time. And at the same time, the audience, people at home, can just buy four sensors for a much lower price. And they can also dance in a virtual audience together and express their, their movements. So, yeah, you can imagine. There's uh, lots of stuff. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, now, yeah, I would like to welcome all of you on stage. I guess we get our own seats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get your own seat. All right. Bring your own seat. Everyone comfortable? Okay. Oh, let's squeeze in a bit. And don't forget, if you're watching us from home, um, you can type your questions on the comment section of YouTube, and we're going to be reading them out here. We can share. 
No problem. Oh, there is already a question. Super. Uh, can we get a mic? For oh, we can share as well here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for everybody for talking. It was super fascinating. Um, Hannah, is it Hanavik? Uh, oh yeah. Um, I have a question. Have you tried um, doing something with air guitar for, with your system? Because I feel like that would that that would be super popular yeah yeah um so um we've basically you can also use just ready to use virtual guitar instruments and you can so as i just showed um you can change a lot of settings like where where this is the zero position so you can say this is basically just the, the note pitch and you can make something like this to change the note and just shaking your hand with the acceleration to trigger the notes um so of course it's not like perfectly fitting out of the box to have a real guitar feeling obviously but uh, you can already do a lot of lots of stuff with with how it, how it is already so um, yeah great are there any more questions from the audience wow okay great <laughs> hi thanks I really enjoyed your talk just now this is for Hen Henrik right um, thanks very much um, you were talking about using Ableton um, but you said also other software is possible. Is something as classical as Sibelius or Dorico possible also? The last one, sorry? Dorico or Sibelius. Um, so yeah, basically you can use any, any software which uh, is compatible with MIDI. And, and usually that's nearly every music software. And um, so as, as I just showed, you have this editor for the controller in Ableton, but you, uh, the mobile app also has lots of configuration possibilities. So basically you can sub set up your specific needs. So for example, on which CC controller you want to send a specific uh, sensor parameter and that kind of stuff. And then you can hook it up to your, to your, to your software, yeah. So. Thanks very much, really interesting. Thank you. There was also another hand up earlier at the back. Hi, it's a question for all of you. Um, do any of you have experience with ASMR, automated sensory meridian response, or uh, brain entrainment sound technology? Can you repeat the second part? Um, brain entrainment technology. So these often are used in meditation and yoga type music for um, and training the nervous system to specific states. So whether that be beta frequency, alpha the frequency, the brain is always um, having electrical activity at a certain frequency. So the, the waking period would be beta. A more relaxed period would be alpha. When you're um, deeply relaxed in a meditative state, that would be alpha theta. Theta is just before you fall asleep, and delta is deep sleep. And there's music, there's like binaural is famous, where you have two different pitches and it creates a third pitch that is an interference signal that's, it causes a pulse. And that pulsing entrains the nervous system to that rhythm. It's pretty amazing stuff. You can also use loud light for that. I'm a fan of all of this. Um, I think Dr. Joe Dispenza has done a lot of really interesting um, workshops. I think he does them regularly, actually. Um, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Um, you can eat to there's a lot of um, talks that he's done about this. Um, I did one experiment with EEG sensors of uh, trying to sonify brainwave data. And it's pretty wild because if you were to take every single moment that the brainwave changes and you translated that into MIDI notes, it actually sounds terrible. <laughs> it just, it moves so fast. But... Um, What's been really interesting was figuring out what kind of parameters to decide when a notation changes so that you could feel some kind of connection between your awareness of your brainwave activity to the sound itself. So I don't know, So let's just say between point zero to like 100 data points of uh, what happens with your brainwave and having that be one note was like one example of what we discovered from that experiment. And what was interesting was when we had people have the EEG headset and they were listening to these ambient mel melodies and they were aware of what their brainwaves were doing and um, we would ask, we would guide it by asking them to be a little bit more concentrated on a specific thought or sometimes we would actually introduce a bunch of sounds and 
try to like take their attention span away from their kind of like more meditative state. And it was interesting because when we did induce them into a bit more of a calmer state, they were able, able to sustain that better. And we could hear it melodically as well. So that was, that was very helpful. Anyone else? No, I think I did pretty much the same in a small scale on my in my couch with a thing like this, and it kind of it's a really nice feeling when you check that your brain can control the beat or can control something. It's a very strong, sen uh, strong experience. I find it's, but it's. Um, I think you explained it very nicely, so I don't have to add much more on this. Anyone else in the audience? Uh, another question for Enric. Uh, I'm wondering about the aesthetics. Does a performer have the ability to calibrate the system in a way that will complement their way of performance, that they can create their own aesthetics while playing music and moving their body? Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, um, because we did, we did a lot of workshops over the last two years with uh, performers or dancers from different genres. And um, so, of course, they, they directly were a little bit, uh, in the beginning, a little bit distracted from their, from their typical dance. But uh, after a few minutes, when they used the sensors, they actually liked it, because they were searching for new movements somehow. And um, maybe you also uh, saw the um, this, um, sense of me for the uh, for the event, which said that when you move the, the uh, when you move the sound changes, and when the sound changes again, you move differently. So basically, you have like this kind of uh, feedback loop. And and at least for us, all of the workshops we did, um, they, the artists really liked this uh, a lot. But to really have like this to cover this very specific kind of movement is, is super hard to to uh, to basically directly make exactly that, uh, that sounds what, what the dancers wish, because usually they are also not, not people who are into music uh, production software, so, so they, yeah, it's a little bit harder to, to, to have this communication. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's always an, a nice experience for them, I would say. The calibration is done only by you as the oh, yeah, programmer? Yeah. Yes, yes, so, so um, the sensor calibration is completely automatically. So they are basically realizing when they are not moved and then they are doing a calibration. And from this point on, you have like very, uh, very high uh, precision. And at the same time, you can control where the zero point is, how, how um, if you want a 300 degree circle or just uh, one, 180 degrees to get a full scale. So you can set all this kind of stuff up to, to actually match, match, match it quite detailed to your, to your needs. Yeah. OK, thank you. I think I can add something to this, because as I said, I'm also a sound artist, and I worked a lot with um, performance artists and we just recently did a project with a performance and science uh, research crew called uh, Replica and what was really new for me that you have like these, I think it was processing, you have like these AI nodes which would record like a whole set of sensor data and then you could like record certain points of movements and the AI would calculate everything in between. And that really was a big game changer for me because we also, we did like with Kinect, we did systems for breakdancers and everybody had to adapt to our system. And now with this AI thing, you can really adapt to the, what the dancers do. And this is, maybe you should check it out. We can talk about it later. I forgot the name of these knots, but, or you check out Replica, you're gonna find it. Yeah. A little bit, uh, so yeah, yeah, for machine learning, is. Definitely, I, I think a solution. However, the problem at the moment is the latency with that. So, so this is like for real-time performances. Uh, it could be maybe a trade-off for for if, if you want to have slow move or if you're moving slowly and you want to have more expression in terms of gestures. Then the AI makes or machine learning makes more sense. And uh, otherwise, if you want to have tight timing or rhythmical approaches like breakdance, then then you probably like to be more uh, the, the the way we are doing it. Yeah. Anyone else here? Because we also have a question. So you go, we have a question also coming from one of our remote attendees. So go more. ahead, please. One more. Um, one to Johannes. Um, so you gave these beautiful examples of annoying appliances in our everyday world that 
produce sounds that do not contribute to our well-being. They are annoying sometimes. So this raises the question, should we start designing commercial like appliances or automotives with, okay, let's start with not making it bad. So the, the examples you, you gave were like, there was, we all have been there. I wanna ask, who's really good at that? Like, which companies, which industries have this sound design, experience design, top of their mind and consider that like an essential contribution to the overall experience design? Is there industries where you say, okay, everyone there has it covered? Are there individual companies who, where you said, it's, it's, the, it's top of That's mind? That's a very good question. Um, I s yeah, the examples I showed were really awful. And that was on purpose, but they were exp uh, quite expensive products, right? And there's, you have like many, many companies who produce, who think they need like beautiful sounds, they have a whole brand sound concept, and then they do all kinds of sound, which I find not very helpful and useful, then you have a lot of sound. And sound is very intrusive, and you don't want to have sound all the time. So it's also, as a sound designer, high responsibility to actually not play sound all the time and play a lot of sound. And then it becomes a bit more difficult to point out the people who actually uh, work well with this. I know a lot of companies who now have sound on their map a lot. Also the car companies, they make like big PR gigs with Hans Zimmer and so forth to create the sounds. Apple, like in every design section, did a good job, <laughs> but now we looked so much into what could be done in the future and I think none of them are there. For example, if you have a lot of electronic things in one room, I think one goal should be that they are all kind of orchestrated. And also talking about frequency, how they affect our brain, all the technology we have, they're quite randomly working with our perception, also light on 60 hertz, that's, you know, there's a different story. It doesn't really affect us in a very good way. And I think now that technology allows us to design these things and we don't have to obey to certain technolo um, technology constraints so much and everything has a little computer and we can put speakers everywhere and so forth. Now is actually the time when we can rethink all this. So, yes, some people do it good, but no, none of them reach the point which I think would be is reaching the potential. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, we have a question uh, for Stefan uh, coming from one of our. Oops, sorry, one um, of the people watching from the live streaming. Uh, he's uh, so. The question is, do you have some experiences in preserving sounds of objects, phenomena that are diminishing from our life for museum purposes and to collect them to preserve and to perform, I mean, original sound, some sort of like archival of sound? Actually, no, but, uh, <laughs> because we are not archive, archive people, like we, we would use would be a great project to use sounds like that if they are archived. We worked, uh, uh, we had one project where we used an archive, or we, uh, we were allowed, uh, it was the project to use an archive of old uh, shellac record recordings. Mm. It was at the um, Humboldt box here in Berlin. So it was were really like 100 or some of the first recordings ever done with shellac, and we used them. But we, we are not, uh, not doing the archive Archivization. <laughs> we are not archiving sounds. No. Does anyone else have any experience with uh, preserving sound in projects for archival purposes or museums? No. Okay. Any other questions in, from coming from here? If not, I can ask some of my own questions. <laughs> So yeah, I was, as I was saying earlier, like something I would like to kind of uh, get your thoughts on, and I think it kind of popped up already throughout the conversation, is the, the idea of silence, right? When you're talking about sound and hearing, 
I think it's also kind of important to talk about silence because when uh, once I learned about this event, one thing that reminded me of was this great interview I listened to one day with this. Um, I think he defines himself as like um, acoustic ecologist, uh, Gordon Hampton. Don't know, don't know, you've probably heard of him before. And he's also like a silent activist. And it's really interesting, like the how he approaches like sound. And he's saying like that, you know, nowadays. Um, silence is basically an endangered species and that silence is not the absence of sound but the absence of noise and then when you were talking Johannes about you know like our lives and how we are living among all these devices and all these sounds I mean we know living in a big city like Berlin like how rare real silence is but then now we don't only have the sound of the city but also the sound of the home and the people and the devices around us so I was just wondering, like, how do you, and this is a question for all of you, I'm just curious, how do you deal with the concept of silence in your work, or how important is silence when you're, like, um, actually conceptualizing your work? That was quick. <laughs> actually, sound is a very, very valuable thing, I find, and it's uh, one of the most important things, at least in, in, in these real-life examples. You know, in, in, in the things we did with Kling Klang Klong or what Stefan does um, or what also you do, I think maybe silence doesn't play such an important part apart from you don't want to have noise apart from that like we have now from the other room, which is kind of affecting me also in my concentration. But I'm fine. I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's, you, we have... A lot of noise everywhere, and there's, for example, this one thing that now we have this big change towards electronic vehicles, and by law they have to make a certain sound. And I mean, this is discussed a lot, but I find, I, I really hope that this goes further and um, they will change a bit the, this technological thing behind it, because actually now I hear like these synthesizers driving by at night and normally with 30 kilometers per hour cars are super silent but now they have like these brand synth sound going on and then you have different cars doing that and then you have like different harmonics and everything is get dissonant and really not looking forward to this um, but I think we will find a solution it's gonna take another 10 years to make a law out of it so um, we're going to have a painful transition phase on that one. But silence, yes, coming back to your question, is very important. And in my case, I think a high responsibility to really use as less intrusive sound as possible, for example. And may I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah sure. If, if you have a really intelligent sound system with sensors, then also a system would actually know what you're doing right now. It would be context aware. So if you're talking, if you have a dialogue, you, everything should shut down and not disturb you unless a fire is there or you would crash into a next car or something and that would know what is important, what not, what should be sound, what would be light feedback, what would be haptic feedback. It's, it's really a multi-model thinking of, and sound is very intrusive and should mm -hmm. be used very um, precarious. Does anybody else here, I, I'll come to you, um, have any comments on that? I can add some, mm -hmm. some little bit. Uh, for us, um, not that we don't like silence, we love silence, but we try to avoid silence because it doesn't mean that it must be loud, but when, when our, our systems, the headphone systems, as I told before, so if you turn off the sound co completely, it's like over. So you, the, if you play a little bit something, it must be just, I don't know, I can't explain, like it's, it's a little ocean, like a little noise or something, Th then people know, okay, it's going on. So for us, just practically, it's not because we, we don't like it, but practically, uh, we more tend to not have uh, silence. How did you approach this project, Sounds of Silence? I'm just curious. I mean, so, the... the the idea behind, uh, or not the idea, but the idea behind how they solved 
to make an exhibition about silence is to not have silence in the exhibition. They had silence, um, they had the John Cage piece, I don't know if you know that John Cage uh, piece, they recorded that live uh, in Stuttgart, but it was not silence. You hear people coughing, you, you hear... Mm -hmm. uh, so there's... The explanation kind of was there's noise or sound is everywhere, you know? So um, when, how we approached it, I'm, I mean, I have to admit, we did it with a sound company like Kling Klang Klong, they are called Ideen Klang from Basel, so um, they concepted the whole thing, you know? And their approach was basically to, to explain what silence can do and what noise can do and how much you need silence compared to noise, like war, like how, what, what war, like the noise of war can do to you, how it can harm you, just the noise, you know? And things like that were explained there. That's really interesting. And you had a comment on that. Can you get the mic or a question? Yes, um, I had a question on the previous topic on uh, electric car sound design. I was wondering if your company is at all involved in that. Yes. Sorry, electric car sound design for electric cars. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Like in in, in the seat, everybody says vehicles, but of course electric cars. Um, if we, if we have to do with that, uh, yes, but I'm not allowed to, <laughs> to say for whom and. How? Okay, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. a shame. <laughs> no, I was, I was wondering, because I think this was also in connection with Kling Klang Klang, there was an open call from Foam something in the mm -hmm. beginning of the year. Uh, they were looking for sound design for the electric bus system of Berlin. And I'm a sound designer, so I did some research. I didn't manage for the open call, but I found this very interesting documentary on the BBC in uh, the bus sound design in, in London where they put a bunch of composers together, um, very famous people from big movies, and they came up with this idea of having a C-sharp major chord as the basis um, for the bus sounds. So that's just what I, I heard this, and I was a bit horrified <laughs> of how, <laughs> how it's going to sound like in the future. Um, I was also wondering how fast the buses need to drive until we get a D. But um, so, I, yeah, you, you cannot talk about it at all. Yeah, well, as I said, I think um, I think it would be great to to think to see, look at these things in a bigger picture, and I think this can only be done by regulation in a way. If you don't want to have like these different dissonant chords one by one, I think also it's quite a terrible idea to have all the time um, cars having C major. I, one example which I found amazing, and it's bec amazing because it's so simple, is if you go in Amsterdam on the airport and one of these little cars in the, in the passenger routes would approach you from the back, they just have this very subtle white noise, like a pink noise, more bass, like psh, 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 psh. doesn't disturb you and you completely always hear them, even if you're hearing impaired, if you hear only some frequencies because it's broadband, you would always hear them never disturbed me. It doesn't go with these beeps like in everywhere else in the world. And this was a very nice, actually a nice implementation on that. And for example, Mercedes did the same. They were just reducing it. I'm not a fan, just saying. I'm being neutral, but it, you know, it's not as Hans Zimmer super score. It's very, keep it simple. You don't have to make brand sound noise everywhere. I mean, it's also a safety issue, you know, in terms of directivity, the noise just tends to be, we tend to be able to tell directivity of noise much more than, than a sine wave or, you know, a synthesizer. Yeah, it's true, but, you know, in, in the future, like, cars like Tesla and nearly every car in the future knows there are people in front, so you could send directly signals to whomever is interested to have that, and you don't have to go 360 to everybody, like people behind you don't need to hear that you're coming, you know. Um, I think this would be like the next step in the technology to have less noise um, in, in the cities. Hope that comes fast. If I can help, I, I, I do. <laughs> yeah, we'd really appreciate a system uh, focused on ambulances because I seem to be on the route of all of them and it's just like, they are so loud in Berlin. It's I'm living at Sonnenallee. Yeah. I completely, I, I think it's mostly police there, but I, 
I don't hear it anymore. It's part of the natural <laughs> atmosphere in my life. <laughs> All right, so just a quick uh, clarification, and I think we have time for like one more question. Um, our previous question from the audience uh, um, that was directed to Stefan about, um, I misunderstood as archiver, and the person just uh, clarified, uh, he meant uh, basically sounds that we might like to listen, that are like pleasurable to us, um, since they form our memory, uh, is there, yeah, any projects that you have been involved with that preserve, let's say, sounds that are important to us, let's say, as human beings, I suppose. No. All right, we move on then. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would just like to pose our last question because we're coming to an end. Um, how have you ever, have any of you ever dealt with uh, uh, sound related projects or, you know, uh, projects are focusing on the sense of hearing uh, for people with uh, hearing disabilities and how did you approach that? Um, I did a documentary or I worked on the sound and music on a documentary where actually hearing impaired children were so that was in Kenya, and they always won the prize in, in, in the dance contest. So and it was kind of this mystery, how can you be hearing impaired and still win dance contests? And that was a very, very amazing um, experience. To, we've been there with them two months, and you would after, we have videos behind the scenes how they would like rap and go completely together synchronized in a rhythm, but you would hear them breathing, you would hear every little thing because there was no beat around but they were all synchronized just freestyling and also you as a bypasser would kind of get into that rhythm so but yeah let's say it's an anecdote <laughs> um, which hopefully is interesting for whoever asked the question but I know some people who work with like sensors like yours really create very useful helpful um, instruments for, for um, in cap people who have, how would you say in English, uh, how did you say again? Uh, yeah, a hearing impaired or... Hearing, hearing impaired, impaired. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe. Correctly. I forgot the name now, but there's one guy who just makes a doctor, um, like a, at the TU Berlin and the audio communication group, um, so if you would write, he or she would write me a mail, um, I can make that link to the project. Okay. Anyone else? Or anything that you have seen, maybe that are not are your own projects? So it's not <coughs> specifically for hearing uh, issues, but um, we uh, actually the, the project was cancelled, unfortunately, or it was paused at the moment. But there's a, a Mexican uh, reviewer who reviews, a YouTuber who, re who reviews uh, electronic music instrument, and he is completely blind. So it's very interesting how he actually gets into controlling music without actually seeing the, the interface, which is super, super critical, obviously, for electronic music instrument. And, and I hope this project will maybe continue in the future because I think motion sensors for this are also very interesting. And also for the same time for mental health um, <coughs> uh, things, we, we didn't do that uh, yet, but I think it could be very interesting for dementia because old people tend to move then, and maybe these just very pure frequencies will get somehow a reaction from them, not like super complex sound, but like, like really, yeah, really simple sounds. So I think in general there's a really huge potential um, yeah, to, to, to use sound in, in any of these, these uh, impairments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone in the audience has any other questions? We have maybe time for one quick one, uh, or if there are any experiences or projects that um, kind of fit what we are discussing that we would like to share? Um, there was recently a concert series from a group called Euphonia. Mm -hmm. That's E O U, let's see, E U F O N I A, and dot I O. And it was all haptic sounds, and um, there was another type, but it, it all sounded pretty much the same, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. So I think they're a local group, Euphonia. Thanks for sharing. We'll look it up. All right, so I guess this brings us to an end. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming here. You, the speakers, you, the audience at home. 
Unfortunately, this is the last Making Sense event, uh, the fourth and last, but you can still watch the previous events and this one on the Expo Berlin uh, YouTube channel. And I wish you all a lovely rest of the evening and thank you again.